speaker for today, Davide Domenici, from the Department of History and Cultures at the University of Bologna in Italy, who's going to speak to us today about one of what are, in fact, many projects that he's involved in. Um, and we're very lucky to have him uh, on the West Coast, partly because <laughs> of the Vancouver SAAs. Um, I was uh, able to see a version of this talk last summer, and I have to say it's one of the most exciting things I've seen in uh, archaeometric approaches in Mesoamerica, but in the interpretation of the archaeometric data in particular. And I won't try and read the entire title. <laughs> yeah, it's um, a long. It's very long, but it was also helpful, I think, in terms of describing what the topic would be. And with no further ado, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. So first of all, good morning. And I want to thank Rosemary Joyce and all the staff of the Berkeley Archaeological Research Facility for the opportunity. And let me also thank my old friend and colleague Arianna Campiani. We worked together many years ago in, in Western Chiapas, and she was instrumental in organizing this this opportunity. Uh, as um, Dr. Joy said to you, I'm going to present the results and discuss some implication of the results of a project um, aimed at identifying that chemi chemically characterizing painting materials on uh, Mesoamerican uh, codices. Uh, I'm uh, almost uh, sure that, I don't know why, for some reason, it doesn't move. It's not moving. Try the, try the arrow keys. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with Mesoamerican codices, but just for the sake of clarity, uh, we call codices pictorial manuscripts. Uh, unfortunately, we have today a very restricted number of extant pre-colonial manuscripts. They are 14, 15, depending on how you count them, and they, are, um, they contain lots of uh, calendrical, astronomical, ritual, divinatory, and historical information. Uh, given their importance, as you can imagine, they're only remnants of a huge number of ancient manuscripts that once existed. They have been subject, uh, object of uh, a long-standing scholarly tradition uh, based on uh, interpretation of their contents and the study of their style. Uh, actually, we, uh, our knowledge of the practical aspects of their production is uh, extremely uh, reduced. Uh, uh, we have, uh, I wouldn't say very much information, but something on the activity of painters, scribes, as you may know, Mesoamerican languages do not uh, distinguish between painting and, uh, and writing. I just collected here a few images of scribes. Uh, and um, for example, these classic Maya images do show codices, classic codices that you can see here with jaguar pelt covers. These are supernatural scribes, while these are human uh, um, scribes in uh, central Mexico. I want to let you note that here we have a woman and she's bilingual, bilingual, because this is the day sign in Central Mexican style, this is the day sign in Maya style, so probably La Pintora uh, was a bilingual scribe. So we know uh, something about the, the work of uh, painters and uh, uh, and uh, scribes, and uh, a good amount of information is contained in early colonial uh, historical sources. This is the most famous, uh, uh, Bernardino de Sagún, Codex Florentinus, in book 11. He devotes a full paragraph, chapter, to the work of painters. Actually, he didn't distinguish uh, very clearly between painters and textile dyers, which is interesting. Apparently, the content of the text, which is, for those who are not familiar, uh, bilingual in Nahuatl, and then it has a, um, a Spanish translation. He describes various colors, various painting materials, probably dividing them between those used by painters, which are the first described in the chapter, and those who are used by textile in textile dyeing. Um, so all this said, we have a very, very uh, uh, reduced knowledge of the materiality of this uh, manuscript. Uh, materiality, which is, uh, 
I would say, pretty surprising. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had the opportunity of seeing uh, a pictorial manuscript. Uh, I, when I first had the opportunity, because as you will see, one of them, one of the extant pre-colonial one is in Bologna, in the city where I work, I was astonished. I, I was used to work on the most famous, most common facsimile of this code. So I was used to this color hues. And then I opened the, the real one, uh, the original one, and I was really surprised by the brightness, by the, the light that was coming out from these pages. So I always wonder about the, the kind of colors and materials that were used in, in their uh, production. Uh, the only uh, information we had since, uh, until a few years ago came from a, a small set of invasive destructive analysis that were done, as you can see starting in 1912, uh, that were done so taking samples of, of some of the codices. Uh, actually this information is not really useful. It is useful but it's r reduced because in, in some cases such as uh, these Maya, cod Maya codices and the codiscospy they only analyze the white background and in other cases they analyze pigments and, and, and colors but with techniques that today are so old that it's not really uh, let's say uh, significant uh, then one day I discovered that in Italy we have this mobile laboratory called Molab which is a European infrastructure uh, funded by the, Euro the European Commission and it is the only mobile laboratory for performing non-invasive analysis analysis on works of art um, and as you see as you can see they per, they built this mobile lab uh, to be used on works of art that are so precious that moving them especially for insurance paying it's uh, impossible this is Ra Raphael Palabaglioni and you see the Molab team working on this uh, on this painting. So the, the Antonius Gamelotti, who is the director of this uh, lab, explained me that since this uh, this is a European facility, uh, the best project you can apply for to the European Commission is a project that involves various European countries, because that that what they expect. And so I was thinking about this possibility, and I said, Antonio, Antonio, I have the project for you. In Europe, we have. Uh, almost all, not all because a couple of them are in Mexico, but most of extant pre-colonial codices are in European countries. And you, here you see Codex Cospi in his uh, actual setting, which is the university library in, uh, in uh, Bologna. And so I thought that it was a real important opportunity. And I was always uh, already uh, working with Codex Cospi for another research project I'm, I'm doing. Uh, this image maybe is not really meaningful for you, but it's really meaningful at least for us, because all the objects you see in this image had been in Italy in 16th or 17th century, which is pretty surprising. We had no historical documentation about the arrival of this object. There is kind of, of a uh, uh, paradoxical difference between Spain, where you had lots of inventories, 16th century inventories, and no objects at all. They, are, they have no single uh, pre-Hispanic object. And Italy, where we have lots of this stuff. So I am I'm working on ar archival research, trying to uh, to reconstruct the individual biographies of, of this wonderful set of traveling objects, uh, still trying to understand how they passed in various collections, uh, passing through different regimes of value, how people, how people looked at them, which kind of question they posed to these objects, etc. And as you can see, five of the uh, pre-colonial codices and, and various other colonial ones uh, were or are in Italy, these three uh, Borgia, Cospi, and Vaticanus B are today in Italy or, or, or the Vatican. So I, I propose to the Mola lab Laboratory to start our uh, research uh, project, and uh, so I brought them that were used to work on European paintings in libraries. You can see them uh, here, the, the team working on Codex Borgia in the Vatican Library, and here you see the uh, Madrid Codex in the Museo de America in, uh, in Madrid. And so we started trying to understand which kind of materials were used in the production of these um, of these uh, incredible documents. This is the, the, the list of the most important uh, 
analytical techniques we employ. I'm not the chemist of the group, so I won't go into uh, much detail because it's not my field of expertise, but uh, they are all non-invasive um, techniques so that you, don't, you do not need to take samples, you can perform uh, how many analyses do you want, obviously you have limitation of time, especially of time, but uh, so uh, they are pretty uh, useful. Let's say that in very general terms, probably many of you know better than me how the, this, this technique works, but in general terms you have some techniques that works on the elemental or molecular level as the XRF for, uh, XRF for example so that they say you which kind of chemical elements are uh, contained into the, the painting material and here you see an example for example lots of calcium, lots of sulfur and a little bit of iron so it, you can uh, imagine that this is calcium sulfate which is gypsum and with traces of uh, an iron containing uh, element, in this case a uh, hematite. Uh, so then you have another, uh, other um, analytical techniques that again at this uh, inorganic level do th they provide molecular information, so they tell you something about how these elements are joined in uh, molecules, but the most important uh, part of these techniques is um, are those techniques that uh, help in understanding organic material because as you will see most of these codices were painted with organic material which is a, a problem it's really hard to work with organic colors because if they are inorganics it's pretty straightforward they measure them they say okay this is hematite this is gypsum if it is a flower a yellow flower can we say okay this is a yellow flower but it's up to you now to understand which kind of flower it is uh, so you have a, an example here of uh, near infrared imaging this is the actual color image from from codex madrid and you can see in these false colors as organic elements do uh, emit fluorescence so you see this pink and orange uh, color meaning that here you you have some organic component. This here is indigo and here is uh, cochineal for sure. So when you know that some, there is something organic, you go on with other techniques that tell you something about this organic uh, matter. It's just an example from a, a page of a codex cospi with three different yellows, orange, and this is the result you have. Maybe, basically they say, okay, you have a, a yellow that emits at this wavelength. You have a yeah, an orange that emits at that emits fluorescence at this wavelength. And here starts the problem because if the color, the, the dye is well known and it's indigo or cochineal, for example, the standard spectra are well known. So they say this is cochineal. If it is not, if it is not well known, you have the problem that my problem now to try to understand which kind of organic dye could be part of this. Um, material. Uh, so since uh, 2009 we started our project and uh, so far we have analyzed uh, this group of manuscripts. Most of them are pre-colonial but some of them are also uh, colonial uh, ones such as Selden Roll, Selden and, uh, and uh, Mendoza. To this uh, already huge comparative corpus if you consider how few we knew before, you can add other manuscripts that have been analyzed by other research teams that in recent years have started working uh, with uh, similar techniques and so we have uh, a rather huge comparative corpus today. Today I won't go in detail uh, on a single manuscript, if you have some questions that we can go in detail, but I will try to give you a broad comparative um, discussion. So these are the manuscripts that today comprise our comparative corpus. We can uh, divide them in various groups, for example on chronological uh, base, you see pre-colonial and colonial, on their let's say cultural affiliation or regional provenance, better said, so you have Maya codices, you have, I call them southwestern because they are 
most of them are mixed tech codices, but seldom roll as OU1 are not mixed tech. So I use uh, this more general term and central Mexican codices. Uh, within this group, you can further subdiv subdivide them in, in other groups, such as the Borgia uh, group coming from the eastern Nahua area of central Mexico. This uh, cultural affiliation, this um, subdivision in subgroups has uh, been made on the basis of thematic and stylistic elements. Our attempt is to add a third dimension, the technological one, how this new dimension do fits, does fit with these uh, divisions. So I have a pretty weird PowerPoint. Let me explain how it works. When you see a line, for example, here there is it's not really clear in this one, but okay, a black line, it means that all the manuscript encircled, they share a same painting material. Maybe sometimes not identical, but very, very similar. So all the, the manuscript analyzed so far are painted with vegetal carbon black. Color black is made with vegetal carbon, and it was used for frame lines and to paint full painted areas, both black and gray. A diluted form was used for gray. Only two of the colonial manuscripts, they use uh, a European imported gray, uh, lead gray, uh, which is obviously of, of, of European origins. Now, this, the fact that the carbon black was so uh, thoroughly used, uh, it's not a surprise because historical sources do uh, talk in detail about this color that the now was called clearly, which means black, and uh, suit, as you can see, the Codex Florentinus uh, translate is pine smoke, pine suit, and both uh, Sagun and Hernandez do describe how, the, how they prepare this color by burning ocote wood, uh, pine wood under pottery um, ollas, uh, pottery pots, uh, so that the, the smoke would, uh, would uh, concentrate on their wall. And uh, basically the same work, very similar work, is used in the Maya area. Sibic means both uh, suit, carbon uh, lamp, lamp black, and ink, uh, as this glyph, the beautiful glyph on this ink pot from Hasao Chanka Will Tomb in uh, Chikao. Uh, shows. Um, passing to the white backgrounds, most of the, of the manuscript have a white background. Some of the colonial paper codices do not have white background, but as you can see, white background can be divided in two huge families, the calcium sulfate family and the calcium carbonate family, which uh, in, a, in a certain degree do match uh, uh, cultural division because, as you can see, most of Maya codices do have a calcium carbonate uh, background, and most of central and southwestern Mexican codices have a calcium sulfate uh, background. There are exceptions. Codex Vaticanus B, which is central Mexican, has a calcium carbonate background, and Codex Gorilla, which is Maya, has a calcium sulfate uh, uh, background. Within the calcium sulfate family, we have a, a two interesting subfamily, especially this one is interesting because Codex Loden, because of Fijervari Meyer, do share a mixture of gypsum and dehydrate calcium sulfate, which is anhydrite. We cannot be sure if it is made on purpose of, or the two elements were in a, in naturally occurring in the same uh, uh, area. And Codex Selden, it's, it's interesting because Codex Selden is painted on an older painting layer. So the underline, the old one, has a normal gypsum background, while the later one has this unique and hydrate and calcium carbonate uh, background. Uh, historical sources do speak about white colors in Nahuatl. Tisatl was gypsum and Tisatl was lime, calcium carbonate. Uh, I am pretty mm, convinced that uh, the specific word for, for the material used on codices was Chimaltisat, which, which means shield gypsum. Uh, and it's what we call selenite or uh, lapis specularis, which is uh, uh, gypsum in crystalline uh, form. And, uh, uh, Sagun explains how they prepared, and it's interesting when he says when it is to be painted on, uh, as alluding that it was a kind of a, of a surface to be uh, painted. <coughs> Passing to red colors, uh, again, here the, the correspondence with cultural distinction is neat. All central Mexican and southwestern codices do use cochineal, 
cochineal lakes, uh, usually a mixture of cochineal and alum, and while the Maya codices do you use a hematite, inorganic um, uh, red. Probably uh, recently they published a fragment of what seems to be a codex from Washington, early classic, and they didn't uh, do analysis, but they say that um, at, at, naked, well, at microscopic and, uh, observation it shines as specular hematite, so they suppose it could be hematite. Uh, within the central, the, the cochineal family, we have a well, only codex cospi uses a, a mixture of cochineal, and this is one example. We find they found a red dye. I can suppose it is Achiotl, Annato, Bixa Orellana, but I cannot be sure. And more interesting, as you can see, Lauden for Gervoy Meyer and Selden and Bodley do share the use of a mixture, or, or better said, a hybrid pigment, where cochineal is precipitated on an inorganic clay base. Uh, then you have in colonial codices and in Vaticanus B the use of cinnabar. Remember that Vaticanus B is weird. Uh, if you want, I will talk about it, but it's strange. But remember that cinnabar is only used in colonial time. I, I would say that Vaticanus B, part of it, are colonial. Uh, so it's only used in colonial times. And uh, in colonial times, they also use other reds, ochres, gypsum and hematite, minium. This is strange because many of these materials were used in pre-colonial Mesoamerica on other media, but we do not have evidence of use, uh, they use on in codex painting. Uh, well, this cochineal, I'm sure you all know this, this insect living on, on cactus, or Puncia cactus, uh, well described in historical sources. Uh, the name of the color was Tlapalli, uh, in many books you will find that it's nochestli, but it's wrong, nochestli is the insect, while the color is tlapalli, which is an important, very important word in Nahuatl, because it means uh, red, but also means colored, mm -hmm. in general terms, and it was part of this very important differences, or of dual metaphor, in tlili, in tlapalli, the black and the red, uh, which meant the uh, knowledge, wisdom, but materialized by the very painting uh, materials used. So tlapalli is kind of, a, of an important notion in Nawa. Uh, thinking and you have this description of the use of cochineal lakes that are exactly what we found on codices alum and cochineal they call it tlaquawa tlapali which means hard tlapali and Codis Florentinos described it as an excellent uh, painting material and with various different ash the ashen one was probably a grayish hue on the other hand, Maya Cody says that we saw they use hematite, which is exactly the same painting material they used in, on coeval mural paintings. Uh, on Codex Madrid, we found a mixture of hematite and kaolin, and exactly the same mixture was used in Mayapan mural paintings in Yucatan in the same uh, time. So there is a correspondence between the palette of codex painters and mural paintings in the Maya area, not in central Mexico. And as I said, uh, we found cinnabar in colonial codices, and cinnabar was used obviously uh, in funerary rituals. Uh, you see a photo here from the Red Queen of Palenque. Recently they found cinnabar in the Chichen Itza throne, so it was used to paint sculpture, but not to paint uh, manuscripts. And last one, blue. Most of analyzed codices do use Maya blue, which as you may know, it's a hybrid pigment com uh, composed by indigo and polygorskite. Uh, while uh, uh, Vaticanus B is weird, again, it has two strange no Maya blue, we're still under study, still we cannot understand perfectly how they were made. And as you can see, Codex uh, Bodley and Selden do share a very interesting color, which is kind of a Maya blue produced in central Mexico using local materials, uh, as if they were trying to, to reproduce the recipe of Maya blue, because they didn't have the clay polygorskite, which is only in Yucatan, and it is made uh, sepulite, which is an arche, and comelina, which is another flower, matlali in, uh, in Nahuatl. Actually, you can see that Bodley is also in the family of Maya blue, but there is a single numeral dot painted with Maya blue. Probably it's a late repainting. They, the, it was vanished, the blue, and so someone painted that, that blue. Okay, Maya blue is the most studied 
painting material in Mesoamerica, composed by indigo and this inorganic base, that, uh, which is polygroscite. We always say that th this uh, material was not mentioned in historical sources, but recently both Elodie Dupé Garcia and Diana Magaloni proposed that this world, which is quite ambiguous, the shortly, could be the Nahuatl name of uh, Maya Blue. And well, Maya Blue, it was used in, in the past, especially in the Maya area, and at least since the Epiclassic, also in central Mexico. Here you see an Aztec uh, Tlaloc Oya from Templo Mayor painted with Maya Blue. Uh, an example from the Madrid College to show you one of the limitations of our. Uh, uh, techniques. As you can see here, you have a blue god and you see this gray snake. They appear exactly the same at our, to our instrument. They are Maya blue, both of them, indigo and polygon sky. So obviously they had some kind of preparation technique, probably related with temperature, um, that per allowed them to obtain different hues. Most of the Codex Madrid is gray. So you will find in many texts saying, oh, it's simply deteriorated. It probably did, but it's clear that they, used, they made it on purpose. As you can see here, the gray is used to paint things that semantically we know that they were green. This is a jade ear flare, etc. So we don't know how this gray color looked in the past, but probably it was something similar to green or semantically related to green. But yes, we, we cannot understand on the basis of our techniques how they produce these different, um, different hues of colors. And then, as I told you, we identified comelina, which is interesting because this flower is described by Incoris Florentinos and uh, also Hernandez spoke, uh, speak about comelina as another important blue flower used in central Mexico. Uh, the yellow family, it was not the last, I was wrong, uh, as you can see, well, Maya codices, these two Maya codices, they do not use yellow. Uh, in most cases, the other yellows are dyes, uh, organic colors uh, used as um, ingredients of lakes with alum in most cases. Uh, then we have a central Mexican group uh, using uh, ba um, hybrid pigments with clay and also Codex Natal, which is mixed deck, shares this same yellow. And then the big surprise, mm -hmm. we found ore pigment in Codex Cospi, and then we started finding ore pigment in various codices. Before our analysis, it was thought that ore pigment was imported in colonial times. Uh, and as you can see, it was used also on many colonial manuscripts. Now we are sure that it's pre-colonial. Uh, it has been found later on in a Teotihuacan vessel. And uh, a friend in Vancouver told me that we probably have evidence of ore pigment in Olmec times in uh, cave mural paintings in Mesoamerica. It's still confidential, but so it was another of those materials used on uh, in other media and which had a very restricted use in uh, pre-colonial Mesoamerica, and then it was used on, on colonial manuscript. And then, as usual, in colonial times, you have ochres and uh, other uh, limonite, goitite, lots of ochres used on manuscript. As, you saw, as I told you, most of these colors were organic flowers. Uh, these are the three most important yellow colors described by Sagun, Sacatlashkali, Sochipalli, and Quapashtli. Uh, the, the, the botanic identification has been the object of a quite long debate, but probably Cosmos is pretty sure. We made analysis of uh, new, uh, samples that we produce, and it corresponds quite perfectly with the color that we, uh, we have. Uh, and in historical sources, Elodie, Elodie Dupé Garcia uh, was able to, uh, to identify the world, now what were um, referring to these hybrid clay organic uh, uh, pigments, so they correspond to what we had in the codices. And as I told you, or pigment was our problem. Uh, then we, uh, it was used in, in these two uh, very strictly related manuscripts. And interestingly, on only verse of Codex Cospi, a recto of Codex Natal, which has the later parts of these codices. So probably the introduction of ore pigment in a very specific region was a late phenomenon in uh, early colonial times. Uh, yeah, in um, uh, late pre-colonial times, sorry. Uh, and, and as I told you, we found ochres only in colonial manuscript, while we have many examples of the use of ochres in pre-colonial monuments, such as in the Tlaltecutli. 
I won't be speaking about greens because they are very complex. Basically, they sum the complexity of yellows and blues because they are mixtures of the yellows and, and blues that I showed you. And we have various now what terms, again, studied by Yellow D, uh, which, uh, which uh, seems to describe precisely the painting materials we found in our uh, manuscripts. And uh, lastly, well, not surprisingly, uh, colonial codices have gold ink, so European inks uh, used to write alphabetic writing. Uh, now, if I try to sum up all this, uh, it looks a bit confused, <laughs> uh, but uh, still there are some patterns that can be, meaningful patterns that can be discussed. First of all, well, basically when you see many lines, it, it means that there are some kind of threshold, borders separating different technological traditions. Here, all these lines do separate Maya codices from all the other uh, codices. Basically, Maya painters use a very restricted palette four colors, uh, mainly of inorganics. The only organic we know so far is the organic component of Maya blue. And it is precisely the same palette they were using in coeval mural painting. Uh, this is interesting because we know that in classic times, Maya painters used a huge palette, as in Bonampak, they had lots of colors. And we know that the scribes who made the Madrid Codex were uh, had strong interaction with Central Mexican scribes. They were translating astronomical almanacs, Central Mexican astronomical almanacs into Maya format. So we cannot imagine that the Mayas were not able to produce a, a so diverse palette as the, the one used in Central Mexico. This is a problem of cultural selection. They were not interested in having other colors, all the other yellows, oranges. We know that these four colors have important directional symbolism, so probably there is some cultural reason uh, that makes you wonder when we think in, in in a quite diffusionist mode, no? You think, oh, there was interaction, so they must have shared technological knowledge. Probably they did, but they not always assumed that knowledge. If they were not interested in using that, they did not. So in this case, manuscripts and mural painting are using exactly the same palette. On the other hand, uh, in the central and southwestern Mexican uh, areas, the situation is completely different. First, let me very rapidly show you that, for example, you see the Codex Selden and Codex Bodley uh, do share many lines. Uh, they share many materials. They are the, they have a very strong stylistic similarity. I think this is a technological tradition specific of the Tilantongo Haltepec area in the Mixteca. They come from two neighboring pueblos. So I think this is a hint to a specific technological tradition. Interestingly, Codex Natal proceed from the very same kingdom of Tilantongo, but he shares lots of technological elements with Central Mexican, with Borgia group codices. And it is also match, um, matched by stylistic elements. Is as if uh, Codex Natal tells mixed histories, but in a very Nahua style and palette. Uh, for some reason, <laughs> this codex is kind of in between. Codex Colombino stands alone among Mistec codices, and it comes from the coast of the Mixteca. So again, probably a regional um, reason for this standing alone. If we go to the Borgia group, it's interesting. As you can see, well, this is obvious. Vatican B is unique, is weird, is strange. We are still working on it. We will publish it uh, soon, uh, uh, hopefully soon. But Elodie Dupé, f when I first told her of this project, she told me, you will see. Codex Vaticanus B, which is the awful mm, pre-colonial codex, has um, always been said that there's an awful style. She always said that would be the, the most interesting. And she was right. because. Incredibly complex, but uh, leaving it aside, as you can see, Codex Lode and Codex Fajervari Maya they do share many common elements, including that very unique background. And this is interesting because they also share stylistic elements. They are so similar that could have been painted in the same workshop. And also, you can see the use of this 
barren dot is not barren dot numeral system, but something that, that similar to the barren dot numeral, numeral system. They use orpiment, etc. So uh, there is a long debate on, on the area from which they come. Probably they come from the Tehuacan area. It's one of, of the possibilities. So I think that this palette was typical of the Tehuacan region. So we have a subgroup in the Borgia group that is defined on both thematic and stylistic. And now we can add technological element. On the other side, the other subgroup of the Borgia group is represented by Codex Borgia. Codex Borgia is incredible because it has the simplest palette among all the analyzed codices. All of them are organic, no minerals at all, only clays used in hybrid pigment. I would say, I cannot, let's say, I cannot publish it, but uh, if you ask me, I would say that this is the classic palette. Codex Borgia is neat, few colors, the basic ones, is one of the stylistically more important codices, probably painted in the cellular area. I would say that this is a representation, a materialization of the most classic central Mexican uh, palette. So we have these two groups. And Codex Cospi is extremely interesting because its rectal was painted in a style very similar to Codex Borgia with the an almost identical palette, probably in the Cholula area, and then it was moved probably to the te toward the Tehuacan region, where it was painted on the other side by a local painter, as you can see, s using the same, well, painting very similar thematic stuff, but also using the local palette with or piment, etc. So, pro, uh, as I told you, I, I'm studying the biography of Codex Cospi. We now know that he arrived in Bologna on March 1533. We we have all its history documented. Probably we can add an earlier step of its traveling life. So probably he, this object traveled from central Mexico to well, from from the Cholula area from to Tehuacan. Now, as I as I said, the the most distinguishing element of uh, Central Mexican and Southwestern codices is the use of organic colors. They do not use all these ochres and other inorganic elements that they were using on mural painting. So why? Why they obviously decided to avoid all that ochres, for example, that were re really useful in terms of obtaining different color use. I think that there must be, again, a cultural reason, something that is related with the Emic, emic, I don't know, emic perception of the materiality of this, uh, of the manuscript. And so it's the, you, pretty obvious uh, if you work on Mesoamerican stuff uh, that flowers were important. The use of flowers was, was noted by Francisca Friar Motolinia, who as you see, they say Indian painters produce many colors with flowers, and when they want to change color, they used to clean the brush in their mouth. Oh. That you cannot do with ore pigment because arsenic <laughs> trisulfide <laughs> is, yeah. Uh, and I don't, I actually don't know, but this flower on, on the painting of the Pintora is really, uh, yeah, interesting. And you can see here a, a classic, uh, let's say a very famous expression of chanting, you know, the, the flowery world was the, an expression used to, as you can see in this uh, uh, diphrasis, in Sochit in Quicat, the flower, the chant, you know, the flowery world was a, an exp now expression to refer to poetic, to elegant ways of uh, speech. And if you look at Nahua poetry, you have many examples, really interesting. For example, from the Cantares Mexicanos, my songs are greening, my world fruit sprouts. So there are always this, um, let's say, mingling between chanting colors and emission of fragrance, of brilliance, and organic colors are extremely brilliant bright colors. So I think that this brilliance what what painters were looking for. And for example, with flowers you paint things. With songs you give them color. You see again. Oh and this is interesting because as jewel mats shot with jade and emerald sun ray, the green place flower songs are radiating green. They are shining. So this shine coming out from the pages is probably the, the material aspect they were looking at. Okay, you have other examples, I won't go in detail, but this emission of fragrance, uh, that is uh, an emission of song. I think that we can say, uh, being careful, but in some way, the use of this painting material made that 
pictorial manuscripts were perceived as if they were uh, embodying the flowery matter of chant. And so it has something to do with the performance of public performance of this manuscript. Chanting, Burgoa tells us that they put them on walls and they used to chant the manuscript, etc. All this cultural universe uh, uh, had a change in early colonial times. All these lines said, are saying that in colonial times something very uh, uh, new happened, and it is the use of inorganic colors. So they started using cinnabar, uh, uh, ochres, uh, hematite, and, and, and lots of inorganic color. Probably th this trend already started in late pre-colonial time where, where they introduced ore pigment. But obviously, this early colonial material experimentation, as I like to call it, was really strong in, this, uh, in colonial times. You have different timings. You have, when you have a manuscript from um, peripheral areas such as Selden Roll, which is late 16th century, it is painted with a typically pre-Hispanic palette, kind of colonial back, backwater there. But in central Mexico, what is beautiful is you can see the timing of change. So in the uh, 1530s, they t probably they painted Codex Borbonicus, and you can see that it's colonial by many aspects, including the fact that they left space for glosses in many pages, but the palette is completely pre-colonial. It has no single strange color, mm, so it's, uh, from, from a material point of view, it's completely traditional. Ten years after, oh sorry, I was wrong. Ten years after, the painters that worked on Codex Mendoza introduced just a few, I, I, we, we spot just a single point with a lead gray in the pictorial part of the Codex. They obviously used European ink uh, on, on there, but these red gloss is made with ch cinnabar. Mm -hmm. So a local material, but not used in pre-colonial times. So this is the start of, the, of uh, 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 this manuscript embodies the, 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 the colonial material encounter in some way in, in my idea. And then, a few decades later, at the, toward the, the, the middle and the second half of the 16th century, you have lots of inorganic material used in images that, as you, as you can see, they are changing their function. They're, they're, they are, begin, they are uh, something like illustration of text. So there, there is a change in the structure of these objects. They are more and more similar to European books with the tax, this is a biling bilingual tax, etc. And so uh, I think that this early colonial material experimentation is made possible by the fact that uh, scribes are in some way facing a new context of production and performance of things that before the conquest were chanting manuscripts, chanting objects, and now are something like books as, as we um, uh, perceive them. So in some way, uh, to face the challenge of picture writing in the turmoil of colonial world, they, they had the, uh, this opportunity of widening their palette using inorganic elements, both local and European. And ironically, this was happening while Europeans were discovering Mesoamerican organic colors. This is Cochineal, 1565, uh, uh, Paolo Veronese in Italy is painting with Mesoamerican colors. This has been analyzed, not by us. So it's a moment of exchange of painting materials, and well, this is of the global circulation of those objects that I showed you, and also many painting materials, but this is another story. Thank you. Are you open to taking some questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry. Thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. Thank you. And it, I think you're kind of hinting at it perhaps at the end, but you said that cochineal is not in any of the colonial... No, yes, yes, it is. Oh, it, is. it is. It is. It is. In the colonial manuscript, it is. They simply add to, okay. to cochineal, n not in the same painting area, but they start painting red areas, not only with cochineal, but also with hematite, minium, etc. But they, they, they use cochineal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They okay. continue using. I misunderstood. Mm, so yeah. I was thinking that would be. No, no, no. That would be, yeah, surprising <laughs> because although there was an important colonial production of cochineal, both in Oaxaca and various regions. But they're adding to yeah, they're adding to their palette all these inorganic mineral pigments. 
and your thought is just that because of the sort of sh really big shift. Uh, well, I, I cannot <laughs> say. I'm trying to, to figure out why they, they seem to break these very important rules, norms that they, they had in pre-colonial times, made they, they totally ignored a palette they used in mural paintings, so they perfectly knew. Well, the, the argument that you're making that um, flowering speech yeah. Is, yeah. is the discursive thing that they're creating. Yeah. It seems to me that that, that is very powerfully made yeah. by this demonstration of the selection of your yeah. likes. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that my feeling the first time that I opened an original and I said, wow, that wow is, is what they were trying to produce. The, 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 the manuscript j just shining, uh, emitting something. I, I didn't know what it was. I, I only said, wow, the first time. <laughs> now I kind of thinking that. And what there's, a, there's more subtle shading in the, the organic. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. mineral dust. So you get more yeah. texture. Yes. It's actually um, look more lively. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's more vital material. Just let me add to what you are saying. Uh, usually, if, when you read uh, works on st stylistic studies of painting, they always say that in pre-colonial time they only used uh, flat washes, and uh, in early colonial time they start and do shading, which is not true. Uh, you can see various instances of volume rendering in Mesoamerican art, but what is interesting is that in, in some codices, for example in Codex Borgia, you can see that they were using not flat washes, not to represent volume, but to, present, to represent uh, how do you say in English, iridescence, yeah. uh, the iridescence. color, iridescence, shining. Uh, the shining of, of uh, feathers, for example. Mm -hmm. Now it's strange because the, that color in Codex Borgia looks brown, but it was a green. It's a complex yeah. color we have, but it's obviously green. And it's clear they were trying to represent this, this brilliance of feathers. And if you look at Codex Mendoza, they are trying to represent in a weird way the same effect on green stone. So they, they, were, they were not flat, uh, yeah. flat water. Yeah. but they were not only used to represent volume. Right. They, they were interested in these properties of matter or visual properties of matter that I think it's linked with the flowery matter. Um, you mentioned song and color and there is a, a, a recent interest in the physiology of some people who hear sounds and see colors. Mm. But under I can't imagine you have not heard this, but no. under drugs, which, for example, they did the mezcal from peyote mm. or the LSD from morning glories, which were used mm. in Mesoamerica, um, you might, over millennia, mm. develop technologies of producing music, which is going to create mm. color within the minds of people mm. who are high or stone, and in some populations, perhaps, um, certain Indian populations, perhaps this is a normal state. Mm -hmm. It could be. I, I, I don't know the work you're, you're mentioning. Obviously, it could be. We have even various <laughs> representation. I, I cannot speak of the name. Anesthesia. Mm. Uh, Anesthesia is a, is a cognitive uh, um, Crossing over. Yeah. Well, e even those poetic uh, uh, references are synesthesias because they they are right. taking the songs that colors the, their example. So it can probably be related with some drug uh, consumption, but I think that is a very important element of now aesthetics. If you if you if you think uh, at aesthetics in a very basic way as uh, val attributing value to sensation to perception. The, in Nawa world, the, this process was very complex. When you read Nawa poetry, you see that this uh, adding layers of, of values, of, of uh, even moral values to, to, a, to sensor, sensorial to perception is... Now you've got to see. Uh, uh, okay. Well, in Codex Vatican, in Codex Vindobonensis, there is uh, nine wind playing a musical instrument and chanting while some guys are eating uh, mushrooms and the, the, the music they emit that make that the sun uh, rise. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Nico. 
I was wondering if you have evidence of maintenance or refreshing of oh, yeah. changing chemistry. Yeah, it. yeah, we have lots of them. Uh, so we have, on one side, repaintings of whole codices. Codex Seldon, for example, is completely repainted. We have um, evidence of repainting of specific parts of codices uh, for cultural reason, they were changing part of calendars, probably when the Codex was moving from an area to another one. Codex Vaticanus B has a, a very clear occurrence of this kind. You have, um, I, I don't know how to say it in English, in Latin is pentimenti, when they painted something and, the, and they usually use a, a, f a white calcium carbonate layer to to delete what yeah. what they paint, uh, yeah, <laughs> and um, then you have cases such as Codex Bodley, uh, where probably this uh, hybrid Comelina sepiolite uh, paint was not very good, so it flaked out, mm -hmm. and someone repainted some numeral dots with Maya blue yeah. in ancient times, obviously, mm -hmm. and then you have the sad discovery we did. Codex Borgia is heavily repainted in modern times mm -hmm. with uh, Prussian blue. <laughs> we, yeah. When we discovered that, I, I had the, 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 the nightmare of going to the guy at the Vatican Library and saying, um, your, your manuscript had Prussian blue. Probably because uh, it, it was uh, on blue and on yellow, uh, probably because this hybrid pigment, they have this clayish component, are quite. Uh, hard and so they tend to how do you say deflake or yeah, 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 flake yeah, off. yeah flake off and so someone Lemony. probably restored <laughs> so they, they told me they are going to make archival research at the Vatican to see if Franz Erle or some of the conserv or the old conservator tried to so we have various evidence of and uh, it is not my work but a colleague Ludo Snyders is working on Codex Selden on a page that has been grated in the 50s and he was able with multispectral uh, multi camera to see the uh, yeah. underlying layer, just the horizontal lines and, and some outline of the figures, but at least it said us that the codex that is under there was a typical mystic codices read in Bustrophedon fashion with the figures typical historical mystic code, so it's, in, it's interesting, but it's very hard to see okay. that layer. Are you contributing to the volume that came out of the conference yes. in Oxford? Yes, yes. So there was a conference at the Bodleian Library last June that we were part of, um, where I saw the first version mm -hmm. of this amazing research, and that conference volume will include work um, uh, by yeah. Ludo, yeah. Um, his work, as well as a, like a wide array of yeah. really quite, yeah. quite cutting edge things on color and manuscript and uh, even mm. feather work. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, it's what. And, and Ludo also, when, when we were at the Bodleian working in, on the course and looking at them, he took photos of the cover of Covered at Selden. He went home and tried to play with Photoshop and then he sent back as a look at these photos. He just enhanced the contrast and you have all the jaguar spots on the cover. Yes. yes. Yeah, it, it, it is the head of the, of the jaguar. Uh, we thought it was another kind of skin. We, we see all the jaguar pelts in, in classic iconography of the Maya codices, but there, that's the original jaguars. Other codices have a s European seal cover. Codex Cospi is nice in Bologna because it has a parchment cover written that it, uh, with an inscription saying that it was a um, Natale, um, Christmas. Christmas gift uh, given in the 17th century of this Chinese book. And then they deleted Chinese and they, and they were Mexican. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rev Jim is of value. Okay. Okay. I don't know if we have uh, any, uh, if we don't have any other questions, I want to um, uh, ask you to join me in thanking our speaker for sharing this really interesting research. Thank you. Thank you.